Hey guys, welcome to The Market is Open. Check out our website, themarketisopen.com. Today we're going to talk about the 5G mobile internet tsunami. Uh, this is something that uh, Jim Cramer highlighted about 10 years ago uh, for 4G. Uh, well, now the 5G boom is coming and I'm going to uh, talk about it in the next coming videos. I'm going to tell you actually what Kramer recommended uh, about 10 years ago and how those uh, stocks worked out. And I'm also going to go over some of the, the new picks uh, for, for 5G and, and playing that trend. Uh, but first of all, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, we have tons of stock videos that you'll enjoy, uh, so please subscribe, you won't regret it. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about 5G. Uh, so usually every 10 years, uh, the technology, a new technology arises, cell phone network technology. Uh, it takes about 10 years uh, sort of for the, the technology uh, to start, to, to uh, expand and, and scale out and to mature. Uh, and then by around that time, the next available technology is ready. Uh, so basically, these are the different Gs. Uh, you can see now at the end of 2020, uh, we're sort of just, uh, I wouldn't say finishing with 4G, but we're moving on uh, to 5G networks in order to get a high speed internet to your, your mobile device. Uh, so let's go over sort of the timeline and how this, this uh, has been working. Uh, so in the 80s, you had like a basic, basic cell phone. You can make like, I think, one-way calls, like it, it was not good. Uh, in the 90s, the flip phone, the original cell phone came out. You can make uh, phone calls and you can send uh, text messages. Uh, now in the year 2000, things got more interesting, uh, 3G, uh, got was a little bit more powerful. You could sort of use, uh, I guess, the baby internet on your phone, uh, and of course, do the same features, uh, have the same features that your regular phone has. Now, in 2010, uh, sort of at the end of 3G, when 3G was more mature and 4G started to come out, that sort of enabled all these uh, cool applications on on iPhones, and and sort of allowed for more complexity in terms of apps and, and more power uh, in terms of delivering faster internet that that allows you to create new uh, applications that we, we didn't have before. I mean, just think of all the different iPhone applications or, or cell phone applications that we have now like, that were not available at all on your old Nokia phone, for example. I mean, 4G is offering us some speeds. You can watch a video now on your phone. You know, sometimes it buffers and things like that. Like, it's way better than what it used to be, but it's still uh, not perfect, I guess. Uh, but now we have, starting in 2020, this new technology called 5G, uh, which will allow us to have uh, internet speeds that are 10 times faster as what we have now. And you'll be like, well, why do we even need that? Uh, well, you'll see, we'll, t we'll talk about that in some of the applications. And, and there's also some applications that we haven't even thought of yet, but maybe people will be able to uh, take advantage of once they have such a powerful connection to a, a mobile device. Okay, so uh, the goal of 5G is to have a much more powerful network connection. Uh, you also want to have a, a very stable and a fast connection uh, with extremely low latency. So we're going to need some new technologies for that. Okay, so the first thing is uh, that they sort of need to open up the frequency bands that aren't being used yet. The government auctions off bands of frequencies uh, and you can send data on frequency. The more frequency bands you have, the more data you can send. Between the 6 gigahertz and the 300 gigahertz range, which is called uh, millimeter waves, that uh, bandwidth is going to be unlocked. Uh, now the problem with this type of frequency is that it doesn't travel very far without being blocked by buildings and trees, for example, and things like that. Uh, like radio waves, for example, are sort of long waves and they're at lower frequencies and they're able to travel huge distances through walls and through everything. like. It's a, it's, they're pretty good frequencies, uh, but you can't send that much data on those, those frequencies. Uh, so by opening these, I mean, we, we have new challenges that we need to address, uh, but we also have this huge opportunity to send way more data. Uh, so one of the tricks to address the, the fact that these signals don't reach as far is simply to have uh, more cell towers. By having more cell towers and more base stations, you're going to have better network coverage and, and cover areas that have, you know, a lot of buildings, like for example, in, in a downtown area. I mean, there probably already is a, a huge amount of, of small cell towers in order to support, you know, a, a denser population and all the buildings there. Uh, but all those cell towers will definitely need to be upgraded to support uh, 5G. Uh, but there's definitely going to be a lot of spending in, in, in other areas in order to add more of these cell towers uh, with the 5G technology. So not only do they need to upgrade the network, but they also need to add more towers. 
Uh, MIMO is basically, it stands for multiple input, multiple output. Uh, so you might have like 12 antennas, for example. 5G might have 100 uh, antennas. So maybe a factor of 10 times more antennas. That means more hardware, uh, more antennas, and more interference and complexity uh, as compared to other technologies like 4G. So basically that means there's going to be a lot more spending by these uh, carriers in order to build out uh, this more powerful infrastructure with more cells and more hardware. Uh, now there's these two other tricks that they have. Uh, beam forming, basically uh, sending data uh, as a stream and to a certain location for better coordination uh, of uh, signals. Uh, I, in my opinion, that just adds uh, complexity but doesn't really add uh, more spending by carriers. I mean, and since we're uh, like a stock channel, we're going to try to figure out which companies are going to be best to capitalize on this trend. Uh, so I'm not going to get into too much on, on beam forming. And, uh, and also full duplex, uh, we're not going to talk about that too much as well, but basically it's a new technology to send signals back and forth better without as much interference. The base stations are going to, again, need to be upgraded in order to support these technologies if they're going to be used, if they're going to be used. But the, the main takeaway here is that uh, the race has basically begun for, for carriers uh, like Verizon and AT&T and, and those companies to start building out their 5G infrastructure. Uh, they're going to be spending a huge amount of money. Uh, I mean, just imagine if uh, like like AT and T got there first, how would Verizon, you know, feel? <laughs> like all the customers would switch over to AT and T. Uh, what happens if uh, Samsung gets the first 5G uh, phone, and, and uh, like Apple's going to be behind? So basically, uh, there's there's some competition, and these cut these companies are going to be competing against each other to try to build out the network, try to add 5G into their their products, into their cell phones. Uh, but of course, it's not just phones, it's other devices as well. Uh, but the point here is, is that uh, like the race is on, uh, these carriers are going to start spending and they've already started uh, and 5G is happening. It's not something that's pie in the sky, like it's currently happening. Uh, it's just at the beginning though. These rollouts, as I showed, usually take about 10 years to play out uh, and, it, and it might take a couple years for them to sort of get ramped up and for you to start seeing uh, new products uh, using these technologies. Okay, so some of the applications uh, that 5G will enable. To me, the most tangible and interesting one was the automotive aspect of this. So basically, cars are gigantic mobile devices. So far, cars have not been uh, really connected to the internet too well. I mean, some of them have like OnStar or some baby, basically the baby internet, the baby connection, which is synonymous with like how Steve Jobs announced the iPhone. He was saying that the older phones sort of had the baby internet, whereas the iPhone had OS X uh, capabilities. So basically that's sort of how I'm comparing it for cars. Uh, cars sort of have the baby internet now, but, but now they're really going to have like a, a connection that you've never seen before. Uh, like it's going to be gigabit connection to your car uh, and that's important for for sort of analyzing data and reacting quickly uh, sending data or information back and forth to a server to make uh, decisions uh, in real time for the car or to bring you know new applications to the car maybe some we haven't thought of yet or just improving the current ones that we have right now uh, but basically there's going to be a lot of hardware spending and, and all the the manufacturers of cars are going to have to start putting uh, chips, in, uh, like uh, 5G chips, into their cars, and there's going to be a lot more complexity in terms of managing uh, these chips to to deliver the the data that you expect. Uh, so yeah, there's a bunch of examples here. Another example is sort of like you can work and play uh, in the cloud from your car. So that's basically you have a connection to the internet. You'll be able to talk to your your server. Maybe you can. You can play video games in your car, but the video games will actually be be happening on the server, and the server will just send back and forth the information required to play the game. So we'll see. I'm sure like a, a whole new set of applications will will come out of of this uh, once you give sort of developers the the capability of transferring this much data. Uh, like who knows what they'll come up with, but but it seems like the the fields of automotive of IoT, the Internet of Things, just having many, many devices that are connected and are ubiquitous all around us that are uh, connected to the Internet uh, will be will be pretty powerful, uh, as well as uh, augmented reality. And there's there will certainly be a lot of uh, machine learning, a lot of machine learning and AI sort of used in all of these products. Uh, and a lot of machine learning and AI is processed in the cloud. So you might want to send it information, have the cloud process and send it back uh, to your your mobile device or your your car, 
I mean, you can see how that might play a role in uh, autonomous cars. Okay, so in 2009, uh, Jim Cramer, the host of Mad Money, if you don't know, came up with these 25, or sorry, 21 stocks uh, for the mobile internet tsunami. Uh, that was when 4G was first being announced, and that was in 2009. Right now it's 2019, it's exactly 10 years later. Uh, we're going to talk about that after I go through these, uh, but basically it's sort of uh, a similar game plan. The, the 4G rollout created like a whole bunch of uh, innovations, a whole bunch of mergers with these companies, and these companies uh, were very successful, most of them. And so with the rollout of 5G, there's all these new companies that stand to benefit uh, from, from that wave as well. Okay, so let's talk about some of these companies. Um, you're familiar, Google and Apple, uh, RIM, which is now BlackBerry, uh, and Cisco, uh, but you not, might not be familiar with some of these other uh, smaller companies. Uh, so Starrent Networks, Starrent Networks uh, was a very interesting company. I remember in 2009 when, when Kramer recommended it, I was going to buy it, but within a few weeks, the company was actually bought out uh, by Cisco. Uh, so they were a leading supplier of mobile infrastructure. Now they're owned by uh, Cisco. Uh, this company Comscope was bought out in 2011 by the Carlyle Group. Uh, which is a global asset managers. Uh, Telabs was acquired by Marlin Equity Partners uh, for $891 million. Techilec uh, was acquired by Oracle in 2013. They were a leading provider of network signaling, uh, so Oracle owns them now. Uh, you've heard of Qualcomm, and Qualcomm is uh, like fighting with Apple right now, but they invented a lot of the, uh, the patents for for 3G and 4G, and, and their chips are in a huge amount of, of mobile devices. Uh, they make processors for, for phones, for example. Uh, Broadcom is now owned by a company called Avago, but basically Avago uh, was a company that went on a buying spree. They, they bought Broadcom, which was a gigantic company, uh, and Avago kept acquiring other little small companies, and now it's one of the biggest uh, chip makers uh, in the world. Uh, they actually tried to buy Qualcomm recently, but, uh, but that didn't work out too well. Uh, NetLogic was uh, one of the companies that was actually acquired by uh, Broadcom. Uh, Xilinx is still publicly traded. It, uh, make, they make FPGAs, field programmable gate arrays, uh, basically for developing uh, sort of hardware applications uh, for, for chips and things like that. Uh, RFMD, RF Micro, uh, merged with uh, TriQuin Semiconductor and they formed Corvo. Uh, Skyworks Solutions is still independent um, and that company went up a lot. I remember it was at around $15 in 2010 and it went up to about $120. Now it's around uh, 80 something dollars. Uh, On Semi is still independent independent as well. Tessera Tech is now part of a company called uh, Xperi. It's X-P-E-R, uh, which does mobile computing, uh, communications, memory and storage and they do like 3D integrated circuits. Uh, Cypress Semi is independent as well. Uh, in my opinion, it hasn't done very much over the last couple of years. Uh, SanDisk was acquired by Western Digital. Uh, they used to make uh, SD cards and, and storage uh, mediums. So right now, I mean, Western Digital and Seagate and Micron sort of all compete with each other. Uh, Arm Holdings was acquired by SoftBank, that's the Japanese company, in 2016. Uh, Acme Packet was acquired by Oracle. Uh, and Akamai is still uh, an independent company. Uh, so this is sort of how uh, the field looks right now. Yeah, so some of the changes here, uh, Blackberry, uh, RIM is now BlackBerry, uh, Broadcom is now Avago, uh, which, I mean, they bought Broadcom and then changed, changed the name of the company to Broadcom, but the ticker symbol is still AVGO. Uh, Corvo was RFMD and TriQuint, uh, so they compete uh, with Skyworks and Avago, uh, sorry, sorry, Skyworks and Broadcom. But for some reason, Corvo hasn't been nearly as profitable as those other two companies. But the interesting thing here is the number of companies that got acquired. So there's far fewer players now uh, in the industry. This is uh, in 2018, uh, how the, the field looks right now. Uh, so here's a quote from Andy Grove. He was the uh, CEO of Intel. So he says he called moments where these ideas took hold 10 times changes or 10, 10x tsunamis uh, because they allow us to do things 10 times better. Mobile internet is one of these 10 times tsunamis. So uh, that was something that Jim Cramer actually quoted from him in 2009. Uh, but I think that 5G is going to be 10 times faster than 4G. 
uh, and there's going to be 10 times less latency. So, so it is another one of those 10 times tsunamis. So what's the best way to play uh, the next 10 years, essentially? Okay, so I've already made a video uh, for Skyworks Solutions and how they're related to 5G, how they're already producing chips and, and getting customers uh, for 5G. I mean, Skyworks is always looking for complex solutions to problems, cu custom or complex solutions. They love complexity. Uh, and 5G, as I, as I showed you before, has so much complexity to it. There's all these new technologies. And I think Skyworks is at the forefront. So check out the Skyworks video uh, that I posted. I'll post a link over here. Here are some other companies that Jim Cramer highlighted just a couple days ago. Uh, he's calling it the 5G boom, and he's he's highlighting some companies that might benefit uh, from from 5G. Uh, so Skyworks, check out the video that I made on Skyworks. I think uh, they're an awesome company, awesome balance sheet, no debt at all, and they make chips for connectivity, uh, Wi-Fi chips, cellular chips. Uh, they also make other different components like power amplifiers. Uh, but basically, they they operate on, sorry, they provide components for the infrastructure for 5G, as well as the the end user devices like like the phones and stuff like that. They provide chips for both of these, so they they're definitely going to capitalize on uh, sort of the build out of the network. Uh, and the chips cost way more than they did for for 4G applications because they have to support all these different frequency bands and all, and all these this uh, new complexity. So, so I think Skyworks is going to benefit hugely. Uh, Avago, which is Broadcom, uh, so Broadcom uh, like acquired so many companies, they still want to keep acquiring companies. Maybe they'll acquire Skyworks or something else. Uh, we'll see. Uh, but they're they're a great company. Uh, again, these companies, uh, Skyworks and Avago, and some other companies on this list, they're also Apple suppliers uh, currently. And you know that Apple's going to have a, a 5G phone uh, at some point in the next couple of years. Uh, Xilinx uh, has been doing extremely well. I mean, they've been on a tear. They make, uh, they're known for their FPGAs. These are uh, field programmable gate arrays. They're basically, in my opinion, they sort of sit in between like a, a custom chip, a custom piece of hardware chip, which is extremely fast, but you can't really change, change it once it's been manufactured. Uh, and a processor, which is, I guess, not as fast, but it could it's general purpose. It can it can do anything it wants. So what Xilinx makes, they make an FPGA. It sort of it sort of sits in between the general processor and the custom chip. So you get the speed of the the custom chip, uh, but you can still customize uh, the application or the hard. You can still yeah you can still customize the hardware uh, after the chip has been made. The FPGA is is programmable. You can, you can change it. So that's. Uh, that's pretty important for developing uh, new new chips and new hardware uh, for these 5G networks. Uh, Intel, of course, Intel, everybody's heard of Intel. Uh, they're here to capitalize uh, as, as well as Qualcomm. I'm sure Qualcomm has tons of the patents uh, for 5G and they're going to be working on their build out. Uh, but I think Skyworks, uh, Broadcom, which is Avago, and Xilinx are I guess smaller companies where the 5G could really move the needle for them, uh, whereas Intel is gigantic. I mean, they also have this uh, like server part of their business and, and uh, you know basic computer part of their business, and they haven't really participated too much, uh, like as much as they could have in the the mobile business. Uh, Qualcomm's participated hugely in, in mobile, but again, it's a big company. They've been having uh, some problems uh, with Apple recently, uh, which might make it a good opportunity, but. Uh, I mean, it has been down on its luck lately. Uh, but again, I think these companies are pretty big. 5G will be a needle mover for them, but not as much as these uh, other companies. Uh, now, Kramer also highlighted Nokia and Eric. These are companies that uh, the government has selected for the build out of the networks because uh, the Chinese company Huawei, as well as uh, ZTE and some other Chinese companies, uh, were sort of, you know, having problems with the US government and they've they're going to be blocked uh, from providing their hardware because, I don't know, they're spying or whatever. So the government has selected companies that they trust, like Nokia and Ericsson, uh, to build out their, their 5G network. Uh, so I think uh, that's great. Those companies will definitely benefit. But again, I believe uh, that they'll, they'll benefit more from the infrastructure side of things uh, and less from the actual applications. Uh, like nobody really uses a Nokia phone anymore. Uh, but I think companies... Avago, sorry, Skyworks, Broadcom, and Xilinx uh, sort of don't care who wins. Uh, they provide chips to, to everyone, all the, the phone suppliers, uh, all the people that are building out the network. So like, it doesn't really matter uh, which of these big companies wins because the, 
uh, these these top three guys are sort of the the suppliers into those companies. Uh, but in all, I think the five G boom uh, is real and it it's here. I think uh, Kramer picked a, a great time to talk about these. It's 2019. This is exactly when uh, the five G boom is st is starting to roll out, uh, and it'll be great investment, a uh, great trend over the next and for sure the next five to ten years. All right, thanks so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, let me know in the comments uh, what you think, and please subscribe to our channel.